Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuits. I kinda promised, and sorta kinda didn't, that I would do something on Bioshock when I've beaten the game. And I beat it today. I'm done with it. Be done on hard mode. Do I have a desire to go back and play it again? No. No, I don't. Some people have said, oh, you'll catch all the stuff the second time around. It's kinda like watching Inception. And I, I guess for some people it might be, but I explored quite a lot. I did miss a couple of things. But nothing I can't really catch on YouTube. I missed the guitar playing scene, which was apparently really great. I also watched the bit right at the end. And before I go on, this is full of spoilers, obviously. Good lord, of course it's full of spoilers. We're going to talk about the ending. We're going to talk about the game in general and the storyline and things that I couldn't really talk about in the other video. I'd also give a final conclusion on the game now that I've beaten it. Cool. A bit of advice. Stay till the very end of the credits. It does take a while, but you do get to hear some great music. And you also get to find out that Ken Levine was actually responsible for writing some of the original songs in that game, which is pretty awesome. The end has a really cool bit of footage of the voice actor and voice actress for Booker and Elizabeth, respectively, practicing and singing and altering the song that they were playing on guitar, which is really cool, actually. It's a very heartwarming moment. Also, right at the end, something that kind of throw th throws things for a loop. Okay, let's talk about the ending then. So, the ending is a buttload of exposition, I believe the Americans like to call it. The British might like to call it a bevy of arse, which sounds more insulting than it really is. The ending is like 20 minutes of exposition, and they kind of shove everything at you all at once, and they do it while you're on rails, really. You might as well be. There's no exploration at that point. Once you hit that last 20 minutes, you are pressing forward for a lot of it. And that's really about it. And you will be told a lot of things. And you will experience a lot of stuff. You won't make any choices. There is only one ending to the game. And then the game will wrap up. You get the credits. And then you get that little bit at the end. Which doesn't really throw things for a loop. As much as it gives a little bit of closure. Interestingly enough. So the ending. For those of you who didn't really realize. And you should be certainly not watching this video. If you happen to have not beaten the game yet. Reveals that everything is a multiverse, which is what we expected anyway. Once you start seeing the different universes in the game, it's pretty obvious to figure out where it's going with that. And that every version of Booker in this multiverse makes one of two choices. Either they go through with a baptism after the events at Wounded Knee to try and cleanse oneself of all of the sin. They take the baptism and that turns Booker into Comstock who then establishes Columbia. Alternatively, you walk away from the baptism, you don't take it, and you become Booker, who later on ends up giving his child, his baby girl by the name of Anna, to Comstock, which is in itself kind of weird. You give it to yourself later on, but it's through a different dimension. You see that the tear has been opened, and that's how she gets pulled through. It also explains the thimble, and the nine fingers, the fact that he desperately tried to get her back, bearing in mind he basically sold her to sort out his gambling debt, bring us the girl and wipe away the debt was the term that was then used a little bit later, and interestingly enough, of course, applies to both situations. That's the cool thing about that particular phrase. It applies to saving Elizabeth from Columbia as well as giving Anna to Comstock in the first place, which instigated the whole set of affairs, which is in itself very strange. But yeah, it explains the the finger thing. Gets cut off as the tear closes. And also, if you combine that with some of the audio logs in the game, explains away the notion of Elizabeth actually having those dimension powers, because there was a part of her in another dimension that actually still being her little finger is apparently what counts there. That's the theory of the two wonderful uh, British physicists in the game who I assume are not pronounced lettuce, lettuce or whatever. You get the idea. So the whole point of it is that because you are Comstock and the pivotal decision was made at the baptism, you being drowned at the baptism prevents everything from happening in the first place. It prevents Comstock from existing, and it's the only real way to actually do that. 
that's where all the divergent possibilities come from. It's kind of standard sci-fi multiverse kind of logic. And then, of course, you start to get your brain bent unless you really think about the timelines and how they work out. The paradox effect causes all of the Elizabeths to disappear because, of course, without him being there, there can be no Elizabeth. However, you then enter this really weird paradox, because without Elizabeth being there, then Elizabeth can't go back to kill Booker in the first place to actually stop this from happening. The paradox, which is well explained by a really cool NeoGAF thread, is that a single Booker must accept the baptism, so the probability of Booker becoming Comstock exists, so that the probability of buying Anna exists, so that the probability of Elizabeth becoming omnipotent and murdering every Booker in the first place exists, which means a single Booker must accept the baptism, so the probability of Booker becoming Comstock exists, so that they you, you get the idea and that kind of loops around now the argument against this of course is that it is a paradox therefore it can't exist the way that you kind of get out of it is to say that every booker that ever attends attended and will attend the baptism always rejects the baptism at that point which means that there is no Comstock, there is no possibility of Elizabeth existing ergo that means that the timeline only exists with the notion that Booker rejected the baptism and then carried on with his life and the universe eliminated any other possibility. There cannot be a single Comstock within the multiverse because if there is, then that means there's an Elizabeth and then that means that this whole thing kind of loops around and you have the situation where Elizabeth kills Booker yet Elizabeth can't exist because Booker's dead and so on and so forth. So that's really the sensible way of doing things and the very end of it also indicates exactly that because that last scene where you see him back in his office asking for Anna could be interpreted as indicating that this is kind of the the end of it and that he's in his office that's where his daughter is you don't actually see if anna is in the crib or not but the most logical conclusion would be that yes she is there that's the timeline now elizabeth no longer exists columbia no longer exists comstock never existed ergo booker continues on with his life in the usual way and there is no possibility of selling anna in the first place because the latuses would never be sent by comstock because comstock doesn't exist so it's interesting a lot of people get very confused by this kind of thing i've read enough sci-fi novels that deal with the whole multiverse and time travel and paradoxes and let's be honest i watch enough goddamn star trek to know how this kind of thing actually works the temporal directive you might want to pay attention to that don't mess with time travel and certainly don't mess with other dimensions it's a nice timeline over on neogaf to actually deal with that Overall, I, I felt that the ending was pretty awesome in terms of the way that it was told. Although, I felt that they did shove a hell of a lot of ending into the last 20 minutes. And that kind of wrecks the pacing of the game. And I think the reason they did that was to try and keep as much of it under wraps until the very end. They did the typical Bioshock thing, which is provide exposition throughout the game and to try and give you hints and yes i imagine if you played it again you would see a lot of stuff that makes more sense now that you realize what's going on personally i made enough sense of it to not really need a second playthrough i feel so to me that's not really a big deal i feel that perhaps they could have done just a little better though they could have made the ending less of a complete info dump. That's probably the best way I would describe it. Just throwing information at you. It's like, quick, we've got to explain it in the last 20 minutes. We've got to reveal everything right now. And keeping a lot of it hidden throughout the rest of the game. And just sort of hinting at it through audio logs and some dialogue here and there. The visitation to Rapture at the end was a great way of, of course, getting rid of Songbird. And the cool thing that people have discovered is that Ken Levine, being kind of a little bit of a mad genius at times, actually put Songbird's death cry into Bioshock 1 in Fort Frolic, specifically, in the engagement with Fitzpatrick. You can actually hear that very same cry there. So what that indicates is that they ended up in Rapture at that time while that was happening, which is in itself insane when you think about it. That is really cool. And there's also a picture, a poster within Bioshock 
that actually has the word songbird in it. It's just, that's, that's insane. That is ridiculous. To its credit, it is an ending that left me extremely satisfied. Yes, it was an info dump, but I felt like it wrapped the story up in a really satisfying and awesome way. It was a story well told. I mean, it is the inception of modern video games, and they did one hell of a job. A lot of stuff that you can read about it. There's a lot of interesting theories surrounding it. As I said, there's a NeoGAF thread that is very descriptive and has, for the most part, a storyline, a timeline, and theories that I would pretty much agree with across the board. Now, let's just talk about the rest of the game, shall we? Because now I'm done with it. Oh, God. That ghost fight. That freaking ghost fight. A reoccurring ghost fight, no less, because... It's not enough just to throw one ghost fight at you. No, you're going to have three. And it is infuriating, especially the second ghost fight where you have no tear-based assistance whatsoever. In ghost fight one and three, you get the tears. You can at least bring some things in to help you out a little bit. On hard mode, that fight is a ball's nightmare. It really is. It is annoying as hell. The best way to deal with it, for those of you maybe going through a second playthrough and dreading that, is... If you destroy corpses using fire or electricity, so basically if you kill them with that and their corpses melt or their heads explode, then they will not be able to be resummoned. So eventually you can just wear her out, she won't have anything to summon, and then you just kind of kill her. And she'll occasionally hit you, but that's really about it. It's still an annoying set of fights, and it served very little purpose. It's like, hey, you know what, we're going to dump this boss in the game, and we're going to make you fight it three times. There's no ending boss at all. The ending boss fight is, of course, the airship battle, which was good. One of the best fights in the game. You use Songbird to either help you defend the core of the ship to make sure you actually make your way to Monument Island, or you can use him to knock down the gunships, which you will eventually have to do, otherwise you will not be able to succeed. It's a good fight. It's pretty well balanced, although admittedly, having the Patriots make a beeline for the shield or the core or whatever it is every single time is kind of weird. Cool place to use traps, finally. You could actually put some planning in there. It was a fun fight. It had the rails around the side, which really helped too, and I enjoyed that. That, that was a nice climactic engagement as far as I'm concerned, and it's pretty much the last fight in the game, and it was probably one of the best ones. That ghost fight, however, just shouldn't have been there. It was infuriatingly bullet spongy. It was horribly repetitive. You could repeatedly die over and over and over again. It was exhaustingly tedious. Shouldn't have been in there whatsoever. But hey, it is. Hey, as far as I'm concerned, you might want to just crank the difficulty down for that fight just for the sake of it. And that kind of gets onto the main point that I'm going to make here, which is... I have come to the conclusion that the combat in this game really does get in the way of the story. And the further you go into, on into the game, the worse it gets. Way more bullet spongy enemies. The guys with the rocket launcher is like a complete pain in the ass to deal with. Handymen. Oh, wow. You, I didn't even think you could make a more annoying version of a Big Daddy. But yes, you can. Oh, God. Really, the handymen are infuriating. Ridiculously annoying to take down, incredibly tedious, bullet-spongy enemies that take very little strategy whatsoever. They suck. They really, really do. And the more of those that I see, the worse it bloody gets. You know, I enjoyed fighting Patriots because there was a reasonable amount of strategy involved in it. This is just, hey, make sure he's not moving so that you can kind of hit his heart, but that doesn't do much damage anyway. Try and stun him as much as you can with the crow and maybe the shock jockey combo. And it just, it's, it's annoying, especially on hard. And... Here's the thing, right? This is a game that's supposed to be about story and exploration and trying to get some cool messages across. And you might notice that what I'm saying is quite similar to Campster's video on the subject. We, for the most part, agree on pretty much everything about this game. The one thing that I don't agree with is that it dealt with racism in a ham-fisted manner. I don't think that's true. I think that a lot of the racist themes and symbology within the game are dealt with in a fairly subtle manner through audio logs and actually through exposition through the scenery rather than direct confrontation with the subject matter. I don't agree that it's all white's bad kind of thing. I don't think that's the case at all. But hey, that's about the only thing we really disagree on. The combat gets in the way of the story and the combat also makes the story ridiculous. 
It is a massacre. It is an absolute slaughter as the superhero-esque Booker DeWitt blasts his way through the population of an entire floating city. And for what? Yeah. What kind of meaningful character interaction do you really get there? The only meaningful character interaction you get is with Elizabeth, which is fine. Don't get me wrong. But I kind of need more than that. I don't think Elizabeth is an interesting enough character to really keep me engaged the entire way through. There are some genuinely touching moments, and the conversations between the two are good. But she doesn't have a huge amount of depth. She is well fleshed out, but I want to know more about her, and there really isn't an awful lot to know because she's been locked in a tower for 17 or 18 years. There is nothing to know. There's actually not that much to her. There are moments which are very well approached. The idea that when you're with her the first time, when you basically murder everybody, she gets really upset about that. The time when she kills for the first time, she gets pretty damn upset about that, and the reaction to it is pretty human, honestly. You know, it's well-developed, I feel. But I've got to say that she seems to get used to the notion of killing pretty damn quickly. I mean, in the very next fight, she's happily throwing you ammo and guns and things like that, and even complimenting you on the fact that you're doing well. I think, really? And come on. There's also a few other issues that I've got with her that I discovered as I went through the game. The idea that her incidental dialogue, which is context-specific, as in catching ammo, throwing you health and things like that, and also picking locks, that seems to be her greatest joy and that's insane when you think about it. It's like, oh, you know what? I really love picking locks. That's a great idea. As soon as I got her out of what was essentially a torture chamber, where she was blatantly horribly injured and very much mentally fatigued and disturbed by the whole thing, it's okay. She turns into a happy, chirpy, give me a real challenge kind of self as soon as you ask her to open a lock. It's like none of those pieces of dialogue are actually specific in terms of context to how she is feeling. And that it never happens throughout the entire game. She doesn't change her demeanor when it comes to those activities at any point throughout the game. That includes finding things like lockpicks and throwing you money and things like that. There was a really horrible moment that dragged me right out of the game when you take down and finally finish off the ghost of Lady Comstock, and then she's having this touching moment, this kind of reconciliation with her, and right at the end of what she's saying in one sentence is, here, I found some money! Like, completely changing the tone of her voice, which is one of the little scripted responses when she actually finds money and decides that's the time to throw money at you. Like, really? That's just one of those little things getting in the way of the storytelling. But the big thing that gets in the way of the storytelling is the combat. It is simply not interesting, and it doesn't get any more interesting towards the end of the game either. You get your generic upgrades, you get maybe some extra salt so you can throw a few vigors around. I finally got a piece of gear that actually gave you a chance of getting salt back on a kill, which meant I could use way more vigors. Did that make the combat more interesting? Not really, because the Vigors aren't actually all that interesting. Uh, really, when you think about the Vigors, there's Mind Control, Fireball, Lightning, Crows, which is bees or any other kind of generic stun. You've then got a charge, you've then got something which pulls people towards you, which is kind of like the opposite of a charge, and also a kind of force push. You've got a shield. And I think that's... Oh, yeah, of course, Bucking Bronco. You know, it's like hover them in the air. And honestly, they overlap roles way too much. It's kind of like damage, crowd control. And Murder of Crows and Lightning are very much interchangeable in that respect. You can use either one. It really doesn't make a blind bit of difference. The only reason you'd swap between them is that some enemies happen to be immune to crows, i.e. most of the actual big guys. There are a couple of combos that you can do, like if you actually send the crows in and then throw a shock jockey, it will electrify the crows for a little bit of extra damage, but as Camster accurately pointed out, it's just a, a generic kind of damage amplifier. That's really all it is. Shame. Big, big shame, in my opinion. Lots of possibilities that could have gone in there, but the game simply doesn't have it. And... I think it's the mindless violence that really keeps me from fully appreciating the story. 
because if you want to have tender moments with Elizabeth or you want to really take the plight of these people seriously or really investigate just what went wrong with the attitudes of Colombia, what turned it into what could have potentially been a paradise into a white supremacist narco-capitalist hellhole with a thin veneer of joyful life is consistently interrupted by bland and mediocre combat that turns it into this gory, messy slaughter fest. And you know what? It really does detract from the experience. It genuinely does. Not just in terms of being kind of a roadblock in front of the next bit of cool exposition and voice acting, not even in terms of simply being unenjoyable. It's in terms of being gratuitous, mindless violence, and actually doesn't really make any sense within the plot of the game. Yes, you're fighting a bunch of religious zealots and things like that. I get that idea. I can deal with fighting splicers. And also, bear in mind in Bioshock 1, you didn't actually have to fight everything. Yes, you had to fight splicers, but you could also do some interesting stuff like play them off against the big daddies, get a splicer to hit a big daddy, get the security system involved and things like that. And you could actually do some more interesting things with the combat. And the big daddies wouldn't attack you unless you attacked them. There is no enemy in this game aside from the two or three... What voiceless boys? I don't know what know what they're called. The the guys with the big helmets on that summon a bunch of annoying enemies in the mental hospital near the end of the game. Aside from them, there is no other enemy that you can legitimately sneak around. They're basically riled up to shoot you immediately. There's no stealth mechanics in the game, and that's not to say that it should have had any stealth mechanics, but. It is a case of everything tries to kill you. There is no respite from that, really, aside from the rare three or four instances where people are neutral to you. And of course, if you make a mistake, then everyone goes for you. I accidentally stole something at one point, and there was another it part of the game where I was inside an area, and I thought, all right, I'm in a room, and I'm going to use my possession to get some extra money out of the vending machine. Nobody saw me, and yet it triggered the aggressive response from the people around and instantly the dock clears and you never see those people again because they vanish into thin air and you're suddenly attacked by the entire Columbia constabulary as well as little flying drones and whatever the hell else they happen to have. It's like, oh, well, you know, I was kind of enjoying this dock and hearing the cool announcers like, no, we're in combat again and we won't be out of it for another 10, 20 minutes. And you know what's really annoying as well? The fact that they lock you into that combat. They really, really do because they lock doors. Their lockpick mechanic is actually deliberately designed to stop you from escaping from a combat area until you've killed everybody. It's a bunch of gladiatorial arena fights because Elizabeth, for some reason, cannot pick a lock in combat. Just bear in mind that she's able to do it in like half a second previously. Even something that requires three lockpicks. Done! Give me a real challenge. You know, it's like, oh, that itty bitty lock or whatever the bloody voice acting is. Yeah, you can't progress out of those areas until you've killed everybody. Which is fairly horribly artificial, I have got to say. It forces you into mindless slaughter. And I don't think that that is a suitable way of dealing with a story of this kind of magnitude. Would it have been better as a different genre? Maybe. Could have been better as a stealth action game. There's a thought. Stealth action and disguising yourself and things like that and actually blending in with the other guys. I mean, that's something that could have potentially worked out and it meant you could have avoided way, way more of the combat, but that's simply not the case. Would it have worked as an RPG? Absolutely. I would have loved to see an RPG in that particular setting. That would be great. Minimize the combat, get some more interesting quests going on, actually interacting with people, and it's not like you can really make any decisions in the game. And some would argue, yeah, there's a reason you can't make any decisions because making decisions is something that the timeline will not allow. There's a very specific set of circumstances that have to happen in order for the ending to occur. Which is kind of right and also kind of not, because there are a couple of choices within the game that you can make. Some people were making excuses for the whole idea that Elizabeth won't stop dancing until you actually interfere and saying, oh, you know, that's all explained at the end of the game. It's really not. If you're saying the world doesn't interact with you very much because 
it doesn't have any way of doing so and that there's really only one choice, then can you explain the scene a couple of hours in the game where you have the choice to open fire on a bunch of potentially threatening folks in a train station or wait and question ask for more tickets, which actually gets your hand stabbed by a knife, which for the rest of the game means you have a bandaged hand and triggers another scene. That is a choice. That is something different that actually genuinely affects the game. So you can't really argue that the reason you have no choices in the game is because you are set on one particular path and timeline, because that's actually a fairly significant event. Getting a big hole put in your hand that's permanent through the entire game is a big deal. That's something that potentially could be viewed, I think, as a plot hole, maybe, or I don't know. I mean, there's very few choices to be made in that game, really. There's like, what, three or four? There's throw the ball at the interracial couple, or there is throw the ball at the guy that's introducing them at the raffle. There's pick the cage or the bird as the little choker that Elizabeth wears, which, you know, deliberately makes no difference. And then there's the train station dilemma. And as far as I know, that is it in terms of actual choices. But there are choices. If there weren't any, then maybe that would make sense. I, I guess it all kind of comes into this notion of possibilities, probabilities, and variables that they have going on with it. So maybe it all ties together. I can definitely get the notion that, yeah, wearing a choker isn't going to make a blind bit of difference one way or the other. It's like, oh, it's got one logo on the other. No, that doesn't make a difference at all. And the whole idea that this is not your first time in Colombia. The Latususes, the Lettuses, as I like to call them, are repeatedly trying to fix the timeline by bringing other versions of Booker from different dimensions to try and actually accomplish the goal because all these other Bookers are dying and the whole coin flip thing that was going on where there's like 117 heads that is indicative of that that's like the 117th time that you've been there at that particular point in time every other time you've failed and gone back and so on and so forth so yeah the storyline's really great and the gameplay isn't it's almost one of those games where you might want to experience it by watching it and by reading about it on the internet. Or play it on easy mode. And that's a sad recommendation, isn't it? Because we complained about the original Bioshock being too easy and that even going up to hard mode isn't really good enough. But on hard mode in this game, you get a lot of bullet spongy enemies, you die very quickly, I mean, you don't have health potions anymore. You've got this freaking shield which takes basically no damage. I upgraded my shield to maximum, it could take about three hits. It's pretty pathetic, honestly. You're continually forced to be looking for health packs, which is very annoying when you have to actually mash F to pick them up, check corpses for them, or rely on Elizabeth to roll a dice and say, yes, I'd like to give you some health now. I, I, I'm, God, I'm duplicating what Camster said, because at the end of the day, he's right on this particular subject. Please go watch his video on it if you want to find out. He is pretty critical of this game. He's more critical than I am about it. So, hey, there you go, and he's beaten it twice. But the thing is, the combat's not fun, so why would you put yourself through more of it? Put it on easy and just blast your way through the combat. Don't even think about it. You can have a lot of fun. You can do whatever you want because good luck dying on easy and experience the story and explore. Exploring's where the joy of the game comes from, not the fighting. Prolong the areas whereby you're not shooting stuff for as long as you possibly can because every time you get into another big slaughter fest it's going to take away from the story it's like oh god i need to get through this combat quickly so that i can get to the next bit of cool story and exposition games should not be doing that although it happens every now and again that's one criticism that could definitely be leveled at mass effect one which did not have particularly enjoyable combat and the combat was getting in the way of reaching the next part of the story in fact bioware games seem to be very much problematic in that regard and that's a shame isn't it and here's the thing i've got to rate games and got to assess games based on how fun they are to play and if one major component of your game which can be considered to be half the game is getting in the way of me enjoying the other half of it i'm not going to tell you that it's an amazing game i will tell you that bioshock is one of the best stories i have ever seen in gaming Phenomenal story. But here's the thing. I could have got all of that from watching someone play it. I would not have got really any extra joy, unless this guy missed everything and was terrible, from playing the game because the combat isn't fun to participate in. And as a result, I could have watched the ending. I could have watched a Let's Play. If your game is better experienced by watching a Let's Play than actually playing it, you have done it wrong. You have made a critical error. 
Now, I'm hoping that things can kind of get redeemed in the post-launch DLC. There's a season pass, so I believe they're releasing at least three, maybe even four pieces of DLC. One of them promised it to focus on the Songbird, who is a very intriguing character that's barely used within the game. He's used more in kind of the last 30 minutes of gameplay than anywhere else. He's just he doesn't even show up all that often he's the kind of character that you would expect to be a constant menace kind of like the big sister in bioshock 2 but he's not like there's like a good seven eight hour period of the game where he just doesn't exist it is entirely possible that one of those pieces of dlc will be way more story orientated and they might be able to fix the combat in some way but the original game bioshock infinite i think in terms of its combat is pretty irredeemable a mediocre combat system combined with an absolute massacre slaughter fest which continually gets in the way in an obnoxious and in-your-face kind of manner. It's funny because there was controversy before the game came out about its new cover and I thought it didn't even matter, right? It's like, oh, it's appealing to frat boys and Ken Levine admitted, yeah, we're going to try and appeal to frat boys because we've got to sell copies of this game. And the funny thing is that the violence also appeals to frat boys as well. It's kind of slow-paced, hit-scan, Call of Duty-esque combat that really isn't all that enjoyable and it's just a massacre and it didn't have to be a massacre and that's the real disappointment and i think the tragedy of the entire game <sighs> so i was happy to have seen the ending i was happy to have experienced the story i just really really wish that the combat hadn't gotten in the way of it and i think that's probably the final thing i'm going to say on bioshock infinite there we go folks i'm done no more Bioshock Infinite. My name's been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Anna. Anna? Is that you?